we're at 632 right now and we want to be um, very respectful of everyone's time. We're going to keep the doors open for people to continue joining us as they are available to. Um, I'm just going to start with a brief introduction before I turn the presentation over to um, tonight's uh, presenter, Jacob Aronsoft. And my name is Patty Smolin. I work as a business liaison librarian, a business reference librarian at the Schomburg Township District Library. I'm very pleased to have just marked being at the library for the last 10 years, uh, plan on more years to come. I enjoy the work that I do. Uh, I help in three primary areas. While I, I do work the public service desk and general reference, I also uh, select materials and plan programs in the areas of uh, business startup and growth and financial literacy and job and career transition uh, transition so with that being said um tonight's program is we have welcomed jacob back for the past nine years and um we are very pleased that all of his content is extremely relevant to those that are in uh, estate planning mode that have questions uh retain re regards to this particular subject. While we do have lots of materials on our shelves in the 340s, nothing is a substitute for professional expertise. Um, Jacob has prepared a presentation tonight. We are asking that if you do have questions, you can answer, answer them into the Q&A option or under the chat, and he will respond to those at the end of the program. Thank you. I'm seeing some lots of congratulations to me for my anniversary. I didn't expect that. That's great. Um, I'm seeing that someone had an audio issue. Um, if there is an audio issue, I think most everybody can hear. If you're having difficulty with it, I am going to put the closed caption on right now. And you are welcome to give me a call. I'm going to give you my direct line, 847-923. 3334. That is uh, right next to the phone. I'll put myself on mute and I'll try to walk you through. Again, 847-923-3334. I am also going to add in the chat um, near the end some additional programs that I have coming down the pike. I have one coming in a couple of weeks about student loan um, management and others that are financially related. So with that said, I am just going to ask for one reminder. Um, the last couple of programs that I've had on Zoom, I have had some individuals that have registered, but have registered for some reason where their email address may even have just the slightest typo. And I am in no position to try to correct that for anyone, but that has been a barrier when we're trying to get the link to you. So the last three presentations I've had, I've had that happen. So when you do register, if you could just take a second glance at your email and make sure that it is your exact address, because otherwise it, it, uh, there's a delay in, in getting you onto the program or getting the materials and we wouldn't want that. Um, brief message, our renovation is nearing its final stage. We are looking forward to having it ready. I'm just going to give an estimate three to four to five weeks at most. Um, we're very pleased that it's gone so smoothly so far, and we will be looking forward to bringing those temporary walls down and welcoming you in and also offering you a tour. I didn't realize as a librarian, I also can be a very fine docent and uh, give you a nice tour for the second floor. So that's all that I have to bring to the table. Um, Jacob, um, has has been a, a fantastic source and presenter, an engaging presenter, not just to our libraries, but to many other public libraries that we work with and receive recommendations from. He was a recommendation to our library from the Niles Public Library less than 10 years ago, and I know that he has spoken at some of the prominent other libraries, and we're always just glad that we get on his dance card each spring. So, Jacob, welcome back virtually, and next year we're looking forward to seeing you back here in person when we have the space. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Patty. Uh, welcome to, tonight to everyone. Uh, tonight, everyone, to today's program on wills, trust, and estate planning basics. Uh, today's program will be approximately an hour. At the end of the hour, I'll open it up for Q and A. Um, while you can put in questions before then, I urge you to wait until the end of the program because I may have already answered your questions by the time we get to the end of the program. 
So what else can you expect from an attorney? There's a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, this program is for informational and educational purposes only. Nothing that you hear today is or should be considered legal advice. If you do need legal advice, you should see an attorney in his or her office. Now, I realize today's program is on wills, trust, and estate planning, but really before I can speak about that, I need to speak about what most of my clients are generally coming to me to try to avoid. And this is what is considered probate or specifically a probate, uh, probate for decedent's estates. Now, probate is the court process for distributing a deceased person's estate. If you die and you have $100,000 or more in total, that is either not in a trust or does not list uh, beneficiaries who survive you, or if you have any real estate in your own name, probate is going to be required. Um, the reason probate's required is the court wants to ensure that if you've not properly planned ahead, that there is a process in place um, so that your next of kin, your heirs at law, get noticed that you've passed away, that creditors can be paid, and that your uh, state after your death can eventually be distributed. Now, a lot of people think probate is the end of the world. It's really not. Uh, I think most people would want to avoid it, though, just because of the time and expense it takes to go through probate. Probate takes a minimum of six months, not from the time of somebody's death, but from the time in a state, the probate estate is opened until it can be closed. Um, and also there's the expense. Probate, I'd say, is usually about three to five times the cost as opposed to planning ahead to avoid probate. And while, as I said, it's a minimum of six months from the time the estate is open, average probate estate is open probably about a year or a year and a half. It may take some time to sell real estate, to finish paying the taxes, see if there are any more funds that are due to the estate or if the estate uh, needs to you know, pay any creditors, et cetera, et cetera. But some people will say, well, you know, I, I, if somebody, if it takes longer or costs more in the event of my death, if I properly planned, I don't really care if I go through probate, that's completely fine. But most people would want to avoid probate to make it an easier process for your friends, families, charities, whoever you may be leaving your estate to. Now, some people will say, well, Jacob, I really don't care about what happens to my money when I die. Of course, if that's the case, I'm not sure why you're watching a program on wills and trusts. But there is something you might be much less familiar with, and this is what is referred to as guardianship, or specifically guardianship for disabled adults. Now, most of us don't like to think about dying, let alone becoming disabled. Or maybe if you assumed if I became disabled, perhaps my spouse, my wife, my husband could make decisions for me. Maybe my adult child could make decisions for me. Or maybe I could make decisions for my adult child who's living at home while working or going to school, etc. Unfortunately, too many people find out the hard way that is not the case. Uh, if you have not properly planned ahead, you would have to go through guardianship in order for somebody, uh, in order to obtain basically um, authority to make somebody's health care and or financial decisions. In guardianship, unlike probate, is not something that's usually done in a year or a year and a half. Guardianship lasts 99.9% .9 of the time from the time when somebody becomes permanently disabled until their death with ongoing court costs, attorney fees, accountings. And if you want to do anything out of the ordinary, like move the person who's disabled from his or her home, uh, if you want to sell their house, uh, move them to a different state, et cetera, you're going to have to get court permission to do anything that's out of the ordinary. Guardianship is also a much more intrusive process. In order to get a guardian appointed, somebody has to get a note from a doctor stating that this person is incapable of making his or her own financial or health care decisions. The sheriff usually needs to serve the person who is allegedly disabled. And then the court has their own court-appointed attorney called the GAL or guardian at litem who interviews the alleged disabled person from a legal process to see if they could make any of their decisions. The court really doesn't want to take away somebody's decisions if they still could make them themselves. But at the same point, uh, there is a point where, you know, there is no choice. And it's 
uh, you know, that is oftentimes your only option. Now, I will tell people if, you know, you're dealing with a probate estate or somebody has passed away or somebody can no longer make their decisions, I really encourage them to start the process because it does take a little while to get a court date, to get all the paperwork signed uh, and to get the process going. Uh, but obviously, for those of you who don't need guardianship or probate yet, uh, that'll be what we're speaking about next, how to plan ahead to avoid it. If you don't get anything else out of today's program, though, guardianship is something you really want to avoid at all costs. Um, it's usually difficult on the person who is, you know, allegedly disabled if they know what's going on. It's difficult on their friends and family. The only person it's really good for, somebody like me, because attorneys were getting paid hourly usually every year, for as long as a person who is disabled uh, is still alive. And by disabled, I mean incapable of making healthcare or financial decisions. Now, I like to call this program Wills, Trust, and Estate Planning Basics. Uh, I find if I just call it estate planning, everyone says, well, I don't have millions and millions of dollars. Do I really need an estate plan? Well, for the purpose of today's program, an estate just means everything that you own. I've had clients who have been on Medicaid and have had $2,000 or less. I've had clients up to 20 million and pretty much everything in between. It's also very important to realize that an estate plan is not a one size fits all. Uh, a lot of times I see somebody who's on TV saying that, well, everyone needs these exact set of documents. That's not necessarily true, uh, really your estate planning documents need to be drawn up so that they fit your individual needs and circumstances, uh, your desires, what your healthcare needs might be, your financial needs might be, et cetera, as well as the needs, desires, and situations of anyone you may be leaving your assets to upon your death. Um, it's not always quite as simple as people think. Sometimes some very small estates can be very, very difficult and sometimes some very Large estates can be very simple. Uh, it really depends, though, on the situation and what's going on. Now, estate planning is not just about who gets your assets, your money, your real estate, et cetera, upon your death. Estate planning is really a process where individuals can determine who will act on their behalf if they become disabled, who's going to make your health care decisions, who will make your financial decisions. If you have minor children, who's going to care for them? Where are they going to live? Who will manage the finances for them until they're adults? And also who will receive your property upon your death? Uh, sometimes just as important, it may be determining who will not receive assets upon your death if there are people related to you that you want to ensure don't receive any assets. Also, will those recipients of your property receive everything at once? Will they receive it in increments at different ages? Will they just receive a stream of income? There's really a lot to consider. Now, the basic estate planning documents are wills, trusts, powers of attorney for healthcare, powers of attorney for property, and living wills. I'll begin with what I think is the, the simplest and move my way down to what I think is the most complex. It's important to point out though that not Everyone needs all of these forms. Some people may need more forms or different forms than what I have listed. It's a case-by-case -case basis, but today's program is meant to be a general program. And these are the documents that do affect most people, although they may be obviously modified from time to time, depending on what needs to be done. So the first thing I'll speak about today is a living will. Now, a living will does not have to deal with who will receive assets upon your death. A living will is really a healthcare form where somebody says, if I have a terminal, irreversible, or incurable injury, don't try to save me. If your medical institution has this form ahead of time and you have an underlying terminal illness, they're not supposed to hook you up to artificial life-sustaining equipment. Things like feeding, respiration, uh, you know, uh, et cetera. Um, but, you know, does everyone need this form? No, not really. Some people may want it. Some people may not. For most of my clients, I generally prepare the form. If, you know, they want to sign it, great. If they don't, that's fine too. Even for a couple, one may want it. The other one may not. That's completely fine. But living wills were in the news a number of years ago. If anyone can remember, there was a young lady named Terry Schiavo. She was in her probably late 30s, early 40s 
never thought about dying, let alone becoming disabled. But for, for close to a decade, she was in a coma. And her husband was in the court system arguing that she should be removed from life support. Her parents were in the court system arguing that she should remain on life support. But what she wanted, we'll really never know. Perhaps if she would have reduced her wishes to the correct legal format, all the time, money, and grief uh, spent on her case could have been easily avoided. Now, the one form that I really think everyone probably does need if they're at least an adult and capable of making their decisions is a power of attorney for healthcare. In this form, you can appoint somebody to make medical decisions on your behalf, and it prevents guardianship. You can name one person at a time to make decisions for you, but as many people in succession as you would like. You cannot name two people at once to do it. Uh, the state of Illinois wants to ensure that the case like Terry Schiavo does not occur. So while that one person that you've appointed could speak to your other friends and family members and medical professionals, uh, one person will make your decision. Also very important to consider who is making your health care decisions for you. While most people, if they're married, may choose their spouse and or the eldest child if they have children, I always tell people, you know, just take a second and consider it. You need to make sure you're choosing the right person for you. If your spouse, your oldest child, your family member, your friend, whoever it may be, is going to be incapable of following through with what your wishes are because of their own personal beliefs, uh, their own religious beliefs, their emotional state, or perhaps, you know, they don't have enough time to devote because keep in mind, this can be something that does take a lot of time. By all means, choose somebody else. But really consider that before you make your final decision. Now, the next form I'll speak about today is the Illinois Power of Attorney for Property. This is not Power of Attorney for Real Estate. This is basically Power of Attorney for Finances. Or if you've read a general publication, uh, you know, it might refer to it as a durable power of attorney. In this form, you can appoint somebody to make financial decisions on your behalf, also one person at a time, as many people in succession as you would like. Just make sure whoever you're choosing is honest, good with money, and decisive. You want somebody who, uh, you know, you know is going to be able to pay your bills, to pay your taxes, et cetera. Now, some people will tell me, well, Jacob, the reason I never did my estate planning, um, I just don't have any close friends or family. I don't have somebody uh, that I could appoint to make these decisions. Or perhaps you have close friends or family, but maybe you don't want to put this burden on them. Maybe they don't have the time. Maybe, uh, you know, they're all your age and, um, you know, you're just worried that they wouldn't be able to assist you in your time of need. But that's not a good reason not to do your estate planning. Planning. Every good attorney uh, who does estate planning regularly usually has some contacts uh, for financial situations. It's usually a trust company or it might be another individual such as an accountant um, for healthcare decisions, perhaps a social worker. Yes, you will have to pay them, but it, they'll be impartial and keep in mind they usually do this for a living. It's not going to be the first time that they do it. Now, I, I also tell my clients you want to make sure that you're just not looking for the first person that you can think of. Uh, you know, if you're struggling to find somebody, perhaps you're better off with a third party if that's possible for your situation. But let me explain why it can be very important to choose the right person. So a number of years ago, I was talking with one of my colleagues who's a banker, and he was telling me about uh, one of his clients, it was an elderly woman. She didn't have any close friends or family, but for her power of attorney for property, she appointed her only real close friend from church who she had known for a few years. Now this banker went above and beyond what most people would do. He decided he would do a search on this lady's good friend from church. It's a good thing that he did because this uh, his client's good friend uh, or her good friend uh, who was supposedly nice and honest, she had several felony convictions in multiple states for stealing money from the elderly. Now, keep in mind, crimes against the elderly have increased more than five or 600 percent since the beginning of COVID. Seniors have had billions of dollars stolen every year 
by scam. So I always encourage people really choose the right person for the job. And now while you can easily make your decisions, make sure you're putting the proper plan and people in place. So in your time of need, they can really help you. I probably got in a few emails this week. Unfortunately, I don't do litigation of people stating, can you help me? You know, uh, my brother or sister is the executor or trustee of an estate and they've been taking money out of the account. Uh, what do I need to do? Um, well, unfortunately you need to sue them, but uh, I haven't done litigation for over 15 years and I'd like to keep it that way. I think if you've done your forms correctly initially and you've chosen the right people, that's not going to be a problem, but make sure you're choosing the right person for the job. Also, the theme of today's program should be don't wait until it's too late. A lot of people will ask me, Jacob, what point in time in my life do I need to do my estate planning? Is it when I retire, when I have my first child? Is it when I have my first grandchild? Well, anyone who's seen my program before, you know the answer. You need to start doing your estate planning after you turn 18 and before you die or become disabled. If you know exactly when you're planning on dying or becoming disabled, by all means, let me know. We can do it the day before. But realistically, this is something people put off way too long. Uh, I've probably had in the last month, I've had three people who have come to me, two who have been diagnosed with terminal cancer and one who recently had a stroke. Um, you don't want to be in that situation where it's an emergency and things need to get done. It's a very stressful situation. It's one that there, it's a lot easier to make mistakes, um, et cetera. Realistically, you want to you know, start your plan as early as you can, no matter how simple or how complex of a plan you may need, uh, you may have. Also, let me give one more example. So a number of years ago, I had a few clients, relatively simple estate, they uh, were just doing a simple will and powers of attorney for healthcare and property. And I called them and I said, okay, well, your forms are ready to be signed. When do you want to come in and sign them? And the husband said, well, you know, we'll come in probably in about six weeks. I said, six weeks? Why do you want to wait so long? You've already paid me the money. I've already got the forms ready to be signed. And the husband said, well, we've got a lot of things going on, vacations, you know, we've got some chores around the house, some things that need to be done. And by the way, next week, my wife is going in for some minor surgery. I said, minor surgery? And he said, oh, don't worry, Jacob, just an outpatient procedure. But I still repeated, you've already paid me when you want to sign it. And he said, well, thanks for your advice, Jacob. Uh, we'll call you in about six weeks. So six weeks rolled by and he called me, but it was not the call that I wanted. He said, well, my wife was recovering from surgery, but there were some complications. There were additional surgeries and now she's in a coma. The doctors are asking for her power of attorney for healthcare so I can make her healthcare decisions and get her medical records. And by the way, all of the money she has is in her IRA. I need to use that to pay for her care. But you've already got these forms drawn up. We can use those, right? Well, of course not. They weren't signed. They weren't witnessed. They weren't notarized. So even though we had the forms, had to go into court, get a guardian appointed for the wife, uh, she lived for about a year and a half, and then she died with about $150,000 left in her IRA. Fortunately, she had listed beneficiaries on her IRA, but unfortunately, those beneficiaries were her parents who were long since deceased. So we had to go into probate court, open up an estate, and as opposed to those monies being invested and taken out during the husband's lifetime, they had to be taken out in one year, all of the taxes had to be paid, et cetera. It's not enough to start your estate planning. You do have to finish it as well. Uh, I usually try to get my clients to come in and sign their forms as quickly as they reasonably can after they're done. Unfortunately, I can't force them to do so, but uh, you, know, you do need to finish your forms. And some people will say, well, that's great, Jacob, but I've already done my estate planning. I've done my will, my trust, my powers of attorney, et cetera. Well, I tell my clients, an estate plan is not something that's meant to be put away in your safe deposit box or desk drawer indefinitely. I've seen plenty of wills and trusts that are older than me on yellowed paper, ones that are 50 or 60 years old with coffee stains, you name it. Uh, chances are, if you haven't looked at your forms for a while, 
things may have changed. Things may have changed with your personal financial or health situation, as well as the personal financial health situations of anyone you might be leaving your assets to, or anyone that you may have named to make decisions for you. And guess what? Even if nothing has changed with you or your beneficiaries or the people making decisions for you, the law may have changed. I can guarantee you if you're in the state of Illinois and you have powers of attorney that are older than July 1st of 2011, they do not comply with the current law in the state. There were a number of important changes that were made at this time. The first one is they revoked prior powers of attorney. What does that mean? Well, if you did a power of attorney for property in 1990, and then you did another one in 2005, you'd assume the one that was done in 2005 is the only one that's good, right? Well, could easily be argued that they're both still valid. If you are using the correct form in the state of Illinois today, um, and you did a power of attorney for a property, let's say a week ago, and then today you signed a new one and properly executed it, the one you signed today is the only one that's still good. There's also a cover page, a little bit wordier than I think it should be, but it does have some useful information for the power of attorney for property. It says by signing this form, you're appointing somebody to make financial decisions on your behalf. You don't have to sign the form, but of course, if you don't sign it, it's ineffective. And if you have questions, you should ask an attorney to explain it to you. Also, power of attorney for healthcare uh, compliance with HIPAA or the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. Well, what is HIPAA? HIPAA is federal privacy law. If anyone can remember way, way long ago when you went to the doctor, they used to hand you some sheets of paper. It used to say that under federal law, we cannot release your information without your prior written consent, et cetera. These days you tap a little screen, that's part of usually what it says, but let me explain what that means. So if you had an older power of attorney for healthcare, it's not to say that um, somebody couldn't make decisions for you, but because the power, old power of attorney for healthcare did not comply with HIPAA, your medical institution or doctor is legally prohibited from basically giving any of the information or your medical records to the person you appointed to make your healthcare decisions. Slightly problematic to say the least. Now, many years ago, some attorneys did something called a HIPAA release. It was a separate form in addition to the power of attorney for healthcare. But if you are using the up-to-date form in the state of Illinois, uh, that should not be necessary. And some people will say, well, Jacob, that's Great, but I did my powers of attorney after July 1st of 2011. I'm fine, right? Well, perhaps not, because January 1st of 2015, the state of Illinois updated the powers of attorney, uh, at least for healthcare, yet again. Keep in mind, prior to July 1st of 2011, the state of Illinois had not updated the Power of Attorney Act for more than 20 years. But, you know, the state planning law is changing. I don't envision any more major upcoming changes, but I can't say one way or another. But the reason for the changes to the power of attorney for healthcare was to make this form more efficient and simple. A number of attorneys, including myself, really felt the prior version of the power of attorney for healthcare was a little too legalese. Oftentimes, somebody might be getting this form for the first time when there's an emergency. They might be, you know, at the doctor's office, they might be at a hospital, an emergency room, hospice. And the power of attorney for healthcare does ask a number of good questions that you should consider. It's only about six or seven pages. And if you take the time to read it, you should be able to understand the power of attorney for healthcare. And the questions it asks is, what do I want my agent, the person you've appointed to make decisions for you to know? What decisions can my agent make? Who should I choose as my agent? What do I do with this form? And what happens if my agent does not act? So really something important to consider. Also, I should give another plug in here. Uh, the best thing you can generally do for yourself, your friends, your families, your charities, et cetera, when you're doing your estate planning, hire an attorney who does this type of work all the time, and that's his or her primary practice. Uh, about 90% of my work is wills, trust, probate, and guardianship. The other type of work I do, I do sell real estate, but oftentimes it's usually because my clients have either died or they've moved to assisted living, nursing home, or moved out of state. I don't really do any purchases. But uh, I usually tell people, 
don't choose somebody because, you know, it's your good friend who's an attorney or somebody did a great job on your real estate closing or your divorce or your bankruptcy. Uh, it's your friend's niece or nephew. Uh, you really need to choose the right person for you. And let me explain why with another example. So a number of years ago, I knew another lawyer uh, and I asked him if he would be a witness for a will signing and power of attorney signing for one of my clients. A few hours later, he called me uh, and said, Jacob, I've never seen those versions of the power of attorney for healthcare and property. Would you give me a copy of those forms? And I said, sure, as another attorney, I know I'd be happy to give you a copy of those forms. But that meant for the last 10 years, he had been giving all of his clients forms that did not comply with the current law. I wish I could say this was a one times thing. This happens all of the time. Every year I have people come to me, perhaps it's because they felt the attorney they recently saw just really wasn't uh, practicing in this area or couldn't really explain things well to them. Uh, about a third of my work is probably redoing other attorneys' work, sometimes because it was done so poorly from you know, the time it was originally done, or sometimes it was done very well, but it just hasn't been updated. Usually I like to try to call my clients every few years uh, and tell them if there have been some updates and tell them to update their forms. Uh, but at the same point, uh, I can't force people to update their forms either. So uh, that's a point um, because I will also point out trying to undo it when somebody has done the forms themselves or used an attorney who really did not know what they're doing. It's usually going to be a lot more expensive if, as opposed to nothing. If nothing was done at all, I had to tell one of my clients earlier today, well, you know, your, your mother had an attorney. He drew up up some forms, but they weren't really updated and it's causing uh, more problems that I could really get into in this, but unfortunately it's gonna be very expensive and time consuming to resolve. So uh, that's not the situation you wanna put yourself or your friends or family in. So onto a form that most of you have probably seen before, but you may or may not be familiar exactly with, with the legalities. And this is a simple will. So simple wills give assets to beneficiaries outright. So for example, a simple will for me might say, if I die, everything goes to my wife, or if my wife doesn't outlive me, everything goes equally to my children. They still do go through probate and then information is available to the public. And people will say, well, I thought if I had a simple will, probate could be avoided. Well, in most cases, usually not. If you have a significant other and you own everything jointly and list each other as joint beneficiaries on every single thing that you have, probate may not be required when one of you dies, but when both of you die, if you have $100,000 or more, it does not list beneficiaries who survived you. If you have any real estate, that's not going to be a sufficient uh, of an in itself. And even if you're married uh, or unmarried, I think a simple will for almost anyone is probably an absolute minimum. Most people, a trust or some other vehicle is going to be better, but not always. And it may depend on your situation, what you want to spend, the complexity, et cetera. But there are some major benefits to having a simple will as opposed to not having any will or to having a poorly drafted trust for that matter. So in a simple will, you can appoint your executor. The executor is the person that when you die is going to be responsible for gathering your assets, hiring an attorney to take the estate through probate, paying off your rightful creditors, and then distributing your money to the rightful beneficiaries. You also get to name your rightful beneficiaries uh, and that can be very important as well. And if you do go through probate and you do have a well-drafted will, it's usually going to be much better and more cost-effective as opposed to if you didn't have a will whatsoever. But let me explain even for a married couple why it's very important, or even for people who don't have a lot of assets, uh, because a lot of times people assume they don't have enough assets to do some kind of estate planning. I assure you, you do, or you may have some assets that you're completely unaware of, and let me explain. So uh, a number of years ago, what happened with one individual was uh, he passed away, he was married, and he had two adult children. His only real asset was his house. 
And for whatever reason, his wife's name was not on the deed. Maybe he owned the house before they were married. Maybe he had better credit and they only put in his name. I don't know the reasoning behind it. But when he died, uh, you know, it wound up going through the probate process. And if you don't have a will or an estate plan in place, the state where you live has a plan in place for you. For Illinois, it's called the Illinois Probate Act. And basically what it says is if uh, I can't go through all the scenarios, but for the scenarios for a lot of people, it basically says if you're married and you have no children, everything goes to your spouse. Everything that's you know not listed in a will or a trust or doesn't have a beneficiary on it, uh, that goes to your spouse. Um, if you are not married, but you have children, everything goes equally to your children. However, if you are married and you have children, half goes to your spouse and half goes to your children. So in this case, because they had two adult sons, <coughs> excuse me, what happened was that half went to the wife and half went to the two sons. One of the sons said, well, mom, I realized that dad would have wanted you to have the house. Um, I'll sign over my share to you. But the other son had a different idea, realizing that if he did not get his inheritance, he might never get it. So he said, no, thank you. I think I want my one fourth interest of the house. Now, as you can realize, no one wants a one fourth interest of the house, but because he became an owner, he was able to force the sale of the home. His mother had to move out and then his mother and brother never spoke to him again. So even for very simple situations, uh, you know, there is a minimum. Also, uh, some people say, well, I'm single. I don't have a lot of assets. Maybe I only have one child. Maybe I have more than one, um, but I don't really have a lot of money. I'll tell you, I've worked with one of my colleagues who does a lot of personal injury, wrongful death, uh, medical malpractice cases. We worked on a number of cases together. I had a client who was destitute. She was on public aid for everything. She had under $2,000 to her name, but because of a horrific bus accident, her estate was worth over one and a half million dollars. Also, I've had people call me and they've said, well, you know, we like to pursue a lawsuit. Um, and I say, well, the, did your parent, you know, have a spouse? No, the spouse has passed away or never married. Okay, do you have any other siblings? Well, you know, I've got a brother, but my dad hasn't, and I haven't spoken to him for 30 years. He doesn't count. Well, unfortunately, I need to tell them, no, they absolutely do count. They're going to get half of that money. Um, and reason being is you didn't do any appropriate planning or he or she didn't do any appropriate planning ahead of time. So very important to at least have some plan in place. Now, you can always have a will without having a trust, but you should never have a trust that does not have a will accompanying it. At least if you're using a living revocable trust, you're most likely gonna have a will that's referred to as a pour over will. They're a supporting document to a trust. They usually stay who will get personal property, uh, things like jewelry, furniture, cars, and anything else that you may have that's not in your trust, that doesn't list a beneficiary on it, goes through the trust upon your death. It's basically a safety net or supporting document, but still very important to have. Uh, unfortunately, one of my clients gave me the best illustration of why you should never just have a trust without a will accompanying it. Um, what happened was my client, her parents had drawn up a trust, but they didn't use a lawyer. They decided to, uh, I think, hire somebody who was a financial advisor, a uh, Legally, if you're a financial advisor or a CPA or you don't have a law license, if you're charging somebody, uh, you can get in a lot of trouble for that. But he only decided, uh, who, or whoever this person was, only drew up a trust. And in order for a trust to become effective, the money has to somehow get into that trust. Ideally, it's transferred during your lifetime, but if not, you should have a poor of a will stating them anything that doesn't have a listed beneficiary goes to the trust. Because what this lady's parents wanted to do, she wanted to give 60% to her and 40% to her brother. But because there was only one a trust and no poor of her will, well, when the parents both died, the son got 50% and the daughter got 50%. It's not what they plan, but there is a very high price to pay when you don't plan correctly. 
And that brings us probably up to the most complex area of today's program, which is a living revocable trust. It's called a living trust because it's created during your lifetime. And usually you're supposed to put the majority of your assets in it during your lifetime with certain exceptions. It's called revocable because as long as you're alive and capable of making your decisions, you can always change it. And there are a number of benefits to having a living revocable trust, assuming you use it properly. Um, if you use it, the trust properly, it can be used to avoid probate and guardianship at least for the assets that are in it. And let me explain why this works. Well, think of a living revocable trust, at least in this respect, like a small corporation. Small corporation can own things. It can own real estate, it can own bank accounts, and it's usually controlled by the president. But if the president dies, becomes disabled, or just no longer wants to do it, there's usually a vice president that steps into his or her shoes and continues to run it. The same thing for a living revocable trust. If you die, if you become disabled, uh, or if you no longer want to manage your assets, there's going to be somebody else who steps into your shoes and continues to manage the trust, either for your benefit while you're still alive or for the benefit of the beneficiaries and creditors upon your death. And this can be used to keep information private. Now, when I was talking about simple wills, I mentioned they go through probate and the information is available to the public. If your estate winds up going through probate, anyone can find out how much money you had and who it went to. And some people will say, well, what do I care about that? I'll be dead. Well, perhaps you really should care. Um, these days, anyone can find out that you passed away. They can look at an obituary, a bulletin from a religious organization. They can find out about your death. Uh, you know, previously somebody might have had to go into court, but anyone could have received a copy of the probate file. But these days, most of this is available electronically. Um, and let me give you an example of why this can be very important. Because a number of years ago, somebody called me. Uh, there was a very frantic situation with their mother. Apparently, what had happened was several years prior to this, their father had died. He had quite a bit of assets but he only had a simple will, it went through probate and went to his wife. And after a number of years, she decided she wanted to move on with her life. And she met a very nice, sophisticated, handsome gentleman. After they had been dating for about six months, he gave her a very nice, sophisticated business proposal. One that didn't just require some of her money, one that required all of it. And her children said, no, mom, what do you know about this guy? Don't trust him. And she said probably what we would say to our children or what our parents would have said to us, which is, thank you very much. I think I can make my own decisions for myself. And sure enough, she gave him that loan. And then she found out he was truly madly and deeply in love. Not with her, but with her money. We don't know who he is. We don't know where he is. The money is gone. Now, a lot of people would say, why would you give me such a stupid idea? I would never do anything like this. Well, as we get older, we're a little bit more susceptible to undue influence. Somebody might be able to get us to do something we did not, we would have not done when we were younger. So sometimes you do need to protect yourself uh, from yourself in the future. Also, can anyone who's listening to this program say they never dated the wrong person? fell in love with the wrong person, married the wrong person, etc. Also in a relationship, I'm not sure why this is the case, but usually one person is managing the money. They're paying the bills, they're making the investments, they're making sure the taxes are paid, etc. Unfortunately, that's almost always the person who dies first. Those of you watching this or thinking about it with your significant other today, you can say, thanks, honey, I know that'll be you. But all joking aside, you may leave somebody not only with the grief of your passing, you may be leaving him or her with a huge financial responsibility that he or she is going to be completely unprepared for. I had some clients who had very well-drafted documents, but they were drafted 30 years ago uh, when the clients were in their uh, late 50s or early 60s. And the wife managed all the money. Of course, she passed away. The husband came to me to update his forms to make some changes. 
Um, unfortunately, every time I saw him, he tried to hand me a box of statements uh, for financial statements and bills. And I said, I can give you somebody who can assist you, but you know, I'm just the attorney. I only do the legal information. And his wife, you know, uh, she kept great records of all the paperwork of where all of her money was. She kept it up here. Uh, she didn't write it down. It was basically, it took a very long time to find it. It took me, a trust company, and the CPA about two years to find out where she had all of the money because she was a CD shopper. She had CDs and investments at probably more than 40 institutions. So that extra few hundred dollars she was making a year cost the estate thousands of dollars for us to try to locate where uh, all of the assets were. And you'd think it would all show up on the tax return. That's only if you report it and only if it makes a certain amount of money, not all of the investments made enough to be reported. And as they were elderly, uh, you know, they didn't always keep the world's best records. And in a situation like that, it could have been set up where the spouse who managed the money just had a trust. And this is what we're getting into. You can provide income to a beneficiary without giving them control, but could have set up a trust had someone or something like a trust company or a friend or family member manage the trust for the surviving spouse, pay all the bills, give them the income, but not have them overwhelmed or have the money stolen. Also giving income to a beneficiary without giving them control. This oftentimes applies if you wanna leave money to minor children or young adults, because if you have not properly planned ahead, they'll get all of the assets when they either turn 18 or 21. And most of us can probably remember when we were 18 or 21. If you would have received $20,000, $10 million, would your first thought have been, I'm going to use this money to pay for my education and invest for my retirement? Probably not. We usually don't make the best decisions as young adults. So for a lot of people, what happens is they might say, um, somebody can manage this money for my children. Uh, can pay for their health, education, maintenance, and support. Maybe when they're 25, they get a third. When they're 30, they get a third. When they're 35, they get a third. Also, uh, I should point out, it's a good idea not to overplan. Unfortunately, uh, one of my friends, her father had done some planning and children uh, are not going to really receive much of the assets until they're 60 years old. Um, usually not a good idea unless the children are all spendthrifts. Um, if you do have a spendthrift, you may want to only leave them a stream of income. If it's somebody who has substance abuse issues, drugs or alcohol, you may want to make sure they never receive the assets all at once. Or if it's somebody who's on Medicaid, you may have to do something either uh, called a special needs trust or leave them out completely because if you leave them money directly and they're on Medicaid, you're going to terminate their benefits and you may actually be doing them much more of a disservice than a service by leaving them money, especially if they're incapable of managing it. So really something uh, that you do want to consider. Also, I'm gonna give one more example of why not to wait until it's too late before I get to my next slide. So a number of years ago, one of my clients uh, came to me because his brother had died. I was assisting him with his brother's probate estate. And as we were heading towards the end of the estate, I asked him, you've seen how long this has taken. You've seen how expensive this is. Wouldn't you want to essentially, um, you know, do an estate plan, a will, a trust, powers of attorney, so it'll be a lot easier in the event of your death or disability, and especially in his case, because he was not married to his significant other, even though he had been with her for 30 years. And he said, yeah, Jacob, great idea. I'm definitely going to do my estate planning with you when uh, I'm done with my brother's estate. But we're snowbirds. Every year when it starts to get cold out, we go somewhere else. We're going to be leaving for Texas in a couple of weeks. I guess if I don't do my estate planning before then, I'll just have to live until I get back. Now, these were his exact words. I can't make this up. But shame, shame for any of you who thought he died on that vacation. You're even more pessimistic than the lawyer in front of you. He didn't die on that vacation. But about three or four months later, he called me and I said, oh, are you back in the Chicagoland area? Are you ready to finish your brother's estate and maybe do your estate plan? And there was a brief pause. He said, I thought I called you a few weeks ago. I guess I didn't. 
Uh, a few weeks ago, I was having some terrible stomach pains. I had to go to the doctor. They removed a tumor from my stomach the size of an orange. By the way, could you do a will, a trust, powers of attorney, and send it to me with instructions? I said, sure, not the way I'd like this to work, but I can do that. He signed off the paperwork, and I was able to transfer his house to his trust. And he came back to the Chicago land area and I asked him, did you do what I told you? You only had a bank account. I know it's not that difficult. Did you transfer that to the trust like I told you? And he said, yes, Jacob, of course I listened to you. Well, six months later he died and unfortunately he did not listen to me. He decided he would listen to his girlfriend because why would you wanna trust your estate planning attorney when your friends, family, or what you read on the internet or read in a publication is going to provide you with so much better advice? His girlfriend said, oh, you should name me as the beneficiary on your account. But in case something happens to me, you should name my adult son and my two minor grandkids. Not to say that naming beneficiaries cannot be a part of your estate plan, but if you do it without legal counsel, watch out, it usually has terrible effects. Because what happened in this situation? Well, when my client died, the girlfriend got the house, she got $50,000, her son got $50,000, and each of the two minor grandkids got $50,000 in an account which they can't touch until they're 18, and then they'll get all of it. Not what my client wanted, but that's the price to pay for not listening to your lawyer and not doing things ahead of time. And some people will say, well, that's great, Jacob, but I've already done my will and trust and powers of attorney. Well, as I mentioned before, it's a good idea to look at your forms periodically. And even if nothing has changed with you or your beneficiaries or the people you've named to make decisions, the law may have changed. January 1st of 2020, the state of Illinois updated the trust law. It used to be called the Illinois Trust and Trustees Act. It's now called the Illinois Trust Code. I cannot go through all of the potential changes uh, because the changes were quite drastic. Um, keep in mind, this is the first time, uh, at least in my practice, but uh, in over at least 20 years that the trust code has been significantly changed. But to give you an idea, my trust that were 12 pages are almost twice as long to comply with the current law. And some people will say, well, what happens if I don't comply? What happens if I don't update my documents? Well, the real answer is no one really knows for certain. Um, there has not been enough litigation yet to deal with it, but I usually tell my clients, look, you've done your estate planning to make this a smooth, efficient, and streamlined process for yourself, your friends, your family, et cetera. If you keep your forms up to date, there should not be any problems aside from, you know, who you may have named to make decisions for you. I cannot make your family or friends be honest or love each other. That's outside of my legal expertise. But if your forms are in place, there should be minimal, if no problems whatsoever. And I will let you know for at least the powers of attorney for healthcare and property, I did have a handful of clients who did not listen to me and did not update their forms because they did not want to. And in most circumstances, it did cause problems with their financial institutions or their medical institutions because the forms were older. If that wasn't enough, and of course, both of these things occurred right around the beginning of COVID, uh, the federal government in December of 2019 enacted something called the SECURE Act. I like to say this makes me anything feel anything but secure. It affects retirement accounts, things like IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, et cetera. Prior to the enactment of the SECURE Act, you could list anyone as the beneficiary. You could list your children, your grandchildren, et cetera, and they could expand that in the event of your death over their lifetime. Now, anyone with the exception of your spouse, there are a few minor exceptions, but not many, they only have 10 years into which they need to take all of the assets out. Your spouse, however, if done correctly, can take an IRA or a 401k or a 403b out over his or her lifetime. Uh, so perhaps, you know, information that I or another attorney may have given before December of 2019, uh, regarding IRAs or 401ks may be drastically different due to the change in the law. Also, some people say, well, I'm really worried about estate taxes, Jacob. Well, 
at least in 2024, if you have less than $4 million and you live in the state of Illinois, your estate is not subject to estate taxes, but the $4 million mark includes everything that you have. Life insurance, even if you don't have, if it has no value now, if it upon your death, it has, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars or whatever it may be that's included in your taxable estate, uh, assuming the insurance policy is in your own name. IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, your house, etc. And if you have $4 million or more, the state of Illinois does not tax what's over $4 million. They tax the full $4 million on a sliding scale. Uh, and the more you have over $4 million, the more it is. It, federal state taxes, if you have under $13,610,000, federal state taxes don't come in. Uh, but if you have more than that, everything in excess of that is taxed at 40%. However, keep in mind, if nobody does anything before January 1st of 2026, the federal estate taxes revert down to 5.4 million adjusted for inflation. Um, so, and with anything above that tax at 40%. So it'll probably depend on what happens with the upcoming election. And I should point out, if you are married and you have proper estate planning done, you can avoid up to twice this amount, not necessarily twice that amount. It may depend who owns what uh, for a married couple. But if you are married and you do plan properly, you can avoid more in estate taxes in, in most cases. Now is the fun part of today's program. You can learn from celebrities, learn about good or bad they did, so you don't have to make these same mistakes. First example I'll give today is Michael Jackson. Uh, believe it or not, it's the only good estate planning example of what to do, not of what not to do. Um, I remember when he died, all of the newscasters read a particular line from his estate planning documents. It said, I have intentionally not provided for my ex-wife so-and-so, she is to be treated as dying before me. The newscasters all read this very solemnly, like, why did the attorney write this in? I assure you every estate planning attorney knew the reason for this. If you have a family member, uh, you know, a close family member, or perhaps a prior spouse, or even a current spouse, if you don't write them out, it's not enough to say, you know, I, gave, I, I have a son and a daughter, I give everything to my daughter, end of story. No, that's insufficient. The old way might have been to say, I give my son a dollar, I didn't forget him to give him anything. But these days, the way you uh, write them out is much different. And if you don't write out your next of kin or your heirs at law, assuming you don't want to leave them anything, they can cause huge problems for the estate. But good luck at Michael Jackson's ex-wife uh, for her trying to contest his estate when on the first page of the documents it said, I didn't want to give you anything. Robin Williams, well, he did some estate planning, but either he didn't listen to his lawyer or his lawyer didn't give him great advice. His children were supposed to receive money at 21. Not a great idea for most of us, let alone somebody who had an estate the size of Robin Williams. Also on your, you know, if you have a trust or a will or powers of attorney, you need to list at least one person to make decisions for you in the event of your disability or death. But I usually tell people it's a good idea to have two or more. And it's also a good idea to have at least one person in a younger generation or perhaps a trust company, assuming your estate is large enough just in case. Robin Williams only listed one person. That person died before he did. And because of that, his estate still had to go through the court process. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Now, during his lifetime, he gave a lot of money to a lot of good charitable organizations. But because when he died, he was unmarried to his significant other, and he only used a simple will, he didn't have any sophisticated planning documents, the charity that received the majority of his assets when he died, it was the IRS. Michael Crichton, this is a library program. Uh, you can check out one of this author's famous books, but perhaps he left us with a mystery he didn't contemplate. What did he want to have happen to his estate? When he died, his most recent trust listed uh, the only beneficiary as a child from a prior marriage. Last I heard, his most current wife was suing his estate on behalf of their unborn child because she was pregnant with his child when he died, but he failed to update his estate planning documents. Mickey Rooney, I'm a movie buff. I like to watch anything from silent film to today's blockbusters. 
But unlike today's movie stars who are only married two, three, or four times, Mickey obviously could not get enough of a good thing when he died. He wasn't on his second, third, fourth, or even fifth marriage. He was on his eighth marriage. And that was the one that really did him in. At some point, she and her adult son managed to imprison him in his own home. They stole all of his money. Uh, he eventually was able to escape. He had his day in court. But while the court ruled that the money had to be returned to him, he died before he ever saw a penny. If you're on your second, third, fourth, eighth marriage, you might want to consider somebody other than your spouse to make decisions for you. And while this sounds outlandish, I can give you a good example of why this can apply to a lot of people, because I do have a number of clients who are, let's say, married and neither of them have children, or one or both of them may have children from a prior marriage. And the concern is if one of them dies and leaves everything to the other, that other person may only leave assets to his or her own family, leaving out your family, friends, charities, et cetera. So that can always uh, be a concern or God forbid they leave it to a new spouse after you pass away. So you've got a few different options. You could, there are ways you can leave your spouse nothing or almost nothing. Uh, you could leave a portion to your spouse and a portion to your friends, families, or charities. Or you could actually set something up where usually you have to have a separate trustee that's not your friends, family, charities, or your spouse, where that money can be held for your spouse. Your spouse might receive the income. Uh, and then upon you know, the spouse's death, if the monies were not needed for his or her benefit, the remaining principal can be used for your friends, family, or charities, not your spouse's friends, families, or charities. So there are a number of ways that if you know how to do estate planning correctly, uh, it can address situations like that. What about Prince? Well, during his lifetime, Prince was being known as actually being a very shrewd and intelligent negotiator. He fiercely negotiated all of his contracts. You are not going to get his content for free. But when he died, he died like a complete idiot. No will, no trust, no powers of attorney, nothing in place at all. When he died, he was not married. He had no children and his parents were deceased. He had no full sisters or brothers or siblings, but he had half siblings. Legally, that's exactly the same. Uh, I believe his estate was only settled in the last two years, but the seven or eight years prior to that, the only people that were receiving money from his estate Accountants and lawyers, at least some of the money was going to a good place. Jim Morrison, he was the lead singer from The Doors, uh, and he decided he didn't need an attorney to do his estate planning. He could do it himself. Before you could get all these things online and fill it out and make God knows how many mistakes, you could make these mistakes, but you could get these forms at a stationery store. Jim Morrison did his own will, leaving everything outright to his wife. However, within six months of his death, she died too. She had no estate planning whatsoever in place. They had no children. She had no siblings. Her mother was deceased, but her father was still alive. So within six months of Jim Morrison's death, his entire estate went to his father-in-law. Now, I heard uh, his family actually did go into court and they received something, but this could have been handled a little bit better. Aretha Franklin, uh, I guess for years her attorneys were trying to get her to do a will, a trust, powers of attorney, et cetera. However, she was a very private person. What this means to an estate planning attorney was she didn't want to tell them how much money she had. I've run into this problem because one of the things I will tell my prospective clients when they're coming in to see me, one of the things I'm going to need is a list of your assets and what the value is. And every now and then somebody says, well, I don't want to tell you. My response is, that's like going to the doctor for a physical, refusing to undress, don't let them examine you, don't let them have a blood draw, and for them to give you any results. It's not a reasonable request. Initially, they thought she didn't have a will, but apparently she drafted one will herself. Several months later, they found out she drafted another one herself. Only caused problems in litigation, could have really been alleviated by you know having it done properly by an attorney who knew what he or she was doing. Now, next one, Candace Bergen. Candace Bergen was 
probably best known for a TV show known as Murphy Brown. But way before Candace, her father was actually a very famous ventriloquist. And this can be used to illustrate that you don't have to treat your children equally, but really consider this before you do that. Because some of my clients will say, well, you know, I've got a husband or I've got, sorry, a son and a daughter. My son isn't doing so well, but my daughter is doing fairly well financially. I'll leave everything to my son or more to my son. I tell them it's your money. You can do whatever you'd like, but really consider that because they may not ever speak to each other again. That's a very realistic possibility. Also on the other side, what if you uh, have given a child a quote unquote loan or more money for his or her education, uh, perhaps to buy a house, whatever the situation may be, or maybe they have given you a loan. Now, everyone always tells their parents, oh, don't worry when you die, I'll make sure my siblings get that much more money than me. I've been practicing close to 20 years in estate planning. I have never seen it happen. If you want to have this effective, uh, you really need to have it reflected in your estate planning documents, unless you had your, you know, your children or whoever you loaned it to execute like a valid promissory note. Almost nobody does that though. Um, but what did Edgar Bergen do? He left absolutely nothing to Candace. Perhaps he assumed she didn't need the money. Uh, maybe he didn't want to give her the money. I don't know, but he did leave $20,000 to the preservation of his ventriloquist dummy. You all might be laughing on that, but you wouldn't think it was so funny if it happened to you. Next one, for those of you who say, I'm too young to do estate planning. I'm just watching this program for my parents or my aunt or uncle or my elderly friend. Look at Britney Spears. She had multiple mental breakdowns. For years, her father was her guardian or in her state, it was called a conservator, but same thing. Uh, she eventually got him removed and had a corporate trustee appointed, but that could have all been avoided if she would have just done powers of attorney older. I don't know what's been happening, but especially since COVID, I've had a lot of younger uh, clients or situations with younger individuals, people in their 20s or 30s uh, who have committed suicide, drug-related issues, illnesses, etc., I've had a few clients who have been in their 20s or 30s admitted to long-term care facilities, et cetera. No matter how young you are, even, as long as you're 18 or older, you really should start thinking about doing some estate planning. Some colleges and universities are either strongly uh, suggesting or requiring incoming students who are 18 to have powers of attorney in place. Uh, Anne Heck, somebody who recently passed away, here's something a little bit more uh, knew what about a digital will. Her former significant other claimed that there were some emails back and forth with a, which established a digital will and that he should be the executor of the estate and should be entitled to some money. The court said no, but there is such of a thing as a digital will. It is recognized in the state of Illinois. However, the courts have not caught up to technology and can't really accept it. Also, as those have only been around for a few years, uh, I tell my clients, we can do it the way we've been doing it for hundreds of years, or we can do it the way we've been doing it for less than five years. I think a pen and paper is a much safer way of doing it. And while I envision digital wills or things that are done you know, online and not necessarily coming into the lawyer's office, may be possible in the future until the law catches up. Uh, it's not something that I would like to do. I will wait for everyone else to make the mistakes, see what mistakes occur, and then at that time, I can do it. Um, for those of you who say this only happens to celebrities, well, here's one of Chicagoland's very own, a Joseph Stankak. Uh, he was just a very modest individual, lived in a small home. Uh, he was unmarried, had no children, no siblings, parents were deceased. He died without a will. He had $11 million. It wound up going to 119 heirs that, uh, people that were you know, legally related to him. They probably had no idea who he was. He probably had no idea who they were. Supposedly there was a will, quote unquote, found, but one uh, very questionable, especially when somebody dies and somebody hears that, you know, somebody had $11 million and no will, uh, that can be a huge problem. Coolio, uh, formerly also known as Artis Leon Ivory Jr. Uh, he died, he had no will, he had seven adult children, all from different women. You can only imagine how expensive and problematic an estate like that is going to be. 
Pablo Picasso, he died with no will. His estate was worth around $30 million. It took more than six years to settle that estate. Uh, lastly, Kurt Cobain from Nirvana. He died at 27. I guess uh, he was married to Courtney Love, but he wanted a divorce from her. The divorce was not uh, finalized, and because he did not do any estate planning, uh, his estate still wound up going to her. He wanted the money to, or the money and intellectual property, I believe, to go to the rest of his band members, but because he didn't do any estate planning, that's what happened. Now, I realize we went over a lot of information today, but don't be overwhelmed. All you really need to start doing your estate planning, uh, you should get a list of your assets, you know, what they are, what their approximate value is, should have an idea of who you want to leave your assets to or what you want to leave your assets to, and then contact a good estate planning attorney and he or she can guide you. So before I open it up to questions, just a few things. Uh, I realize we have a number of people here today. Uh, I will read the questions, but depending on how many I get, I may only be able to answer one question per person, although I'll try to answer as many as I can. Also, if anyone asks me anything that I consider legal advice or sounds just a little too personal or too detailed, I'm gonna say, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that. Also, I'm going to point out one thing. I know I'm gonna get a question. How much is this going to cost me? Well, uh, if you were willing to tell me how much money you had and what you wanted to do in front of everyone else, maybe I could, but this is a library. I couldn't do it even uh, you know, if I wanted to. And, also, um, I think any attorney who could tell you how much the estate, you know, is going to cost to prepare uh, an estate plan, you know, they're not going to do their job. They're not going to do it for themselves or for you. Realistically, the way I work and the way most good estate planning attorneys work, uh, I usually tell my clients or my prospective clients, look, you can see me in my office for up to an hour. You can tell me what you have, what you want to do at the end of that. I'll tell you, this is my price. This is what I recommend. These are your options. If you want to move forward, it's half up front, half when I've got a draft complete. If you don't use me, I don't charge for the consultation. That's as fair as I can be, but that's the only question I will answer on estate planning. So without further ado, if you can enter your questions into the chat or Q&A, I will do my best to answer them if I can. But uh, you know, as I pointed out, you know, uh, no legal advice. So just want to make sure that you can want to receive. chime in before I start reading some of them. I um I just want to make sure that you read them in the order in which they were received because I mean as soon as you started talking we got the first question. Um, we have two in Q and A and the rest are in chat. And I just want to make sure that you have access to view all of them. Okay, so at least I've got the. Uh, Q and A open. I was going to answer those two first, and maybe I'll ask anyone or anyone else to put it in chat because I've got about eighteen entries, but I'm not sure what they are yet. Okay, so uh, but for future questions for everyone else, please put it in chat because I'm going to address the ones in uh, Q and A first. So I'm more concerned that certain people do not get anything from my estate. How do I do that? I do not want my relatives who bullied me to get any of my money or stuff. Well, as I pointed out uh, in the program, there's a way to do that. You have sp to specifically write them out in the will and or trust, depending on what your estate planning is. And a good estate planning attorney can assist you with the correct verbiage. Somebody is saying, I have one child and all my property will go to her. Do I need a trust or transfer on death will be sufficient to avoid probate? Well, Unfortunately, I cannot answer that question. I have no idea about your child situation. I don't know if you have grandchildren or successor trustees, and I have no idea what your assets are. Um, so uh, I do not know. What planning should be done if somebody has received benefits from Medicaid? Well, the answer is it depends. Um, and if you are leaving money to somebody who is on Medicaid and they're under the age of 65, there is something called a special needs trust. If done appropriately, it can be used to supplement but not supplant the benefits that they are receiving. However, it'll depend how much you're leaving them, if it's worth doing that type of planning. Um, and also sometimes if you're leaving them a lot of money, uh, I've had a 
a few clients have even said, you know, no, I'd like to have the money myself and the parent or other person agrees because uh, going off Medicaid, you know, if they're receiving millions of dollars and can manage it themselves, sometimes it's not worth having a special needs trust. So as I said, that's a case by case basis. But now I'll go to the chat questions. Okay, well, somebody asked the same thing, uh, or maybe it was the same person. I have a transfer and death instrument for the house and beneficiaries on my, all of my accounts. Do I need a trust? I can't give legal advice, and I don't know the extent of your assets or who your beneficiaries are, et cetera. Uh, thank you for, let's see. Um, somebody did ask me the cost of doing it. As I said, can't answer it if you... Come to my office, I can, but I can't offer answer it here. Um, and they gave some idea, but still, as I said, I can't quote prices on this program. Now, let's see, uh, who inherits my wife's college debt? Well, uh, technically debt can only be associated to usually that person unless somebody has signed off on as a co-signer. Death is usually not inheritable, but it does go against, it definitely goes against that person's estate. How many years have I been doing estate planning? Uh, this is my ninth year of concentrating in estate planning as an attorney. Uh, I'm just waiting to November 4th, and then I can say I've been practicing 20 years, or November 5th, I can say I've been practicing over 20 years. Uh, thank you for my presentation. It was very useful and informative. Can I, Jacob, can I make my son a beneficiary on your mortgage? There is a lot of equity. Uh, the, that's something, it's probably legal advice. And also, it may also be more of a concern with the lender as opposed to, um, you know, as opposed to what I or you can do. Uh, somebody asking, can we get a recording of the session? So this program is being recorded. Um, I believe I have asked Patty if she can for everyone who signed up to send, you know, a link for the recording. Do people's credit card debt go to their heirs? Credit card debt does not go to heirs, but it goes to your estate. So if you have $50,000, and you have $100,000 in an estate uh, when you die, the creditors are entitled to be paid. Um, yes. But if you have no money when you die, unless somebody is a co-signer or an owner of that card or has signed off like on student loans or any other type of loan, then they are liable. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. A uh, very helpful session and a recording would be appreciated, as I said. Um, I've got another question. Is my legal fee based on the amount of the value put into the trust? Um, as I said, can't really talk a lot about fees, but the, the only thing, you know, usually most estate plans are a flat fee. The amount an attorney charges is not only based on the money, but also the complexity of the estate. I've worked on some very difficult, very small, but very complex estates. And I've had some very large estates, uh, but it depends what somebody is trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish and what their situation is. But uh, I do warn people, let whoever your attorney know how much money you have, because if the attorney is not planning for the appropriate estate, uh, size, it will be very problematic to your estate and hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars can be lost or they may just put in a plan that's really inappropriate for your situation. Thank you. Enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for attending tonight's program. Thank you. Um, I'll stay on for another five or 10 minutes to uh, see if I've got any more questions. I don't know how many people are still here.
Well, Jacob, before we uh, before we bring it to a close, I just wanted to say um, we really do appreciate you coming back this year virtually and understanding that from last year in person and hybrid to this year, um, we've kind of had a go back and rely on virtual next year. We're, we're hoping to have it be very different, but I appreciate that you came back with the same good, solid content and preparation that you did before. Um, I think we've had some good questions. We did have um, 78 people join us this evening. Okay. Yeah, I think we might have gotten up to 81, but I know two of those were us, so maybe 79. Yeah, <laughs> I, have to, yeah I, have to, I have to take me off that list. Uh, you did have a couple more questions. I'll let you address those. Okay, so some person asked how to reach me. So uh, upwards in the chat, I think my information is there. Um, I believe on the handout that was emailed to you, it should have my contact information. Um, it, it should be there, but uh, if you can't find it, uh, let me know. Let me see, and sorry, I've got a few more questions in here somewhere. Um, How often should one review their estate plan? I usually, when I do estate planning for my clients, I usually give them the original a set of copies. I tell them that you should keep a set of copies at home, review it every year or so uh, on your own and make sure nothing has changed with it. Make sure you still want to leave the assets to the beneficiaries. You know, some of my clients have said, oh, the, the person that I wanted to leave money to or the executor has, you know, died or I'm no longer close to them or I don't want to leave them any money or I don't trust them anymore. Uh, that can be a reason, but you may want to contact your attorney every few years. Some of my clients do contact me every year or two and they say, hey, has anything changed with me? Um, that can be a good process. Uh, I've got something on a Medicaid question. Medicaid point of view, if it's your own estate planning, uh, I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Um, is transfer of assets to trust mandatory? What are the pros and cons? Uh, not mandatory, it can go through a will into the trust, but pros and cons, um, sorry, that's gonna be too long of a question and a little too much legal advice and I don't know the type of trust that is being utilized. Uh, thank you. We missed some of the internet crashed in Hoffman Estates tonight. Uh, sorry, will there be a link to a video? Yes, I believe uh, I believe that's uh, possible. Somebody's asking me, do I give soft copies of trust documents? So if for my clients, I, I do give them the originals. I do give them a set of physical copies. If they do want a digital copy, I can either email it to them if they would like or if they want it on a flash drive, if they give it to me in a sealed unopened package, I will attach it to that, but that's about it. Will I be conducting another meeting like this? Uh, when and where? Okay, so I will actually be giving the program uh, more times. I will be here most likely sometime next year at Schaumburg in person. Uh, if you do want to see my upcoming list of programs, you can look at my website, which is www.j is in Jacob, k is in Carl, e is in Edward, law.com. And you can look at my presentation tabs. I do have a number of upcoming programs uh, throughout the suburbs. And I think I might have one in the very, very northwest side of the city. I will be speaking at the Wilmette Library tomorrow in person at 7 p.m. Can I text the website? Sure, www.jke. Everyone, I just want to let you know, if you want to scroll up through the chat, I did put um, Jacob's phone number and his website and his address um, in. And Jacob, you could always add it again. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I did add it one more time. Is Illinois a common, common law state? Um, I'm not quite sure of the question. It is not, it, it's not a state where or, you know, some states have, I'm trying to think of, uh, thanks for the great program. Uh, thank you for your, uh, you know, for your kind words. Um, so in Illinois, you know, you can have property that I think you might ask, be asking if it's a community property state. I'm not sure. Community property means that if you're married, 
You know, there is no yours, mine, and ours. It's only ours if you're married. Illinois is not a community property state. There, you can have mine, you can have yours, and you can have ours. Okay, and for some reason, somebody did put in a Q&A. Have you ever had celebrity clients, anyone well-known? Uh, to my knowledge, probably not, but even if I did, I could not disclose who they are. Um, okay, somebody's saying, wife is not on title to my home and it's our only asset. Would my estate be liable for her debts if she dies? Uh, this is legal advice I can't give you legal advice, unfortunately, because that is a question regarding your situation. Uh, my best advice would be to do some estate planning and get some advice because your situation may be very problematic, but it's uh, fairly similar to an example I gave earlier today. If properties are in a different state, uh, what, you know, what happens? Well, so if you have real estate in more than one state and assuming you're not using trusts, um, et cetera, when you die or you and whatever co-owner or whatnot owns it dies, uh, there will actually be probate in multiple states. The probate where you were a resident is usually the primary state and where your estate planning documents should be done. But there will be ancillary probate estates, usually with a different lawyer, different fees and a whole set of headaches. If you have planned appropriately, and let's say you do a living revocable trust in Illinois and you live in Illinois, the properties from other states could all go into that trust avoiding probate in every state. You don't need a trust in every state where you own real estate. However, if you do own real estate outside of the country, I strongly suggest that you know you have an attorney or no tear or whatever an attorney equivalent is in that country specifically provide for that asset you don't want an illinois will or trust dealing with uh, assets in another country it is a a very difficult uh situation is a non-married partner entitled to a house that another partner inherited uh so the legal answer is it depends. In Illinois, no. If you're not married, it doesn't matter. But there is something known as a civil union, which does have some, if not the same rights. I have not had to deal with a civil union, although, you know, uh, if you are married, it doesn't matter if you're same sex or opposite sex, at least in the state of Illinois. Different states do have different laws on that, though. Uh, but the answer is if you're not married in the state of the law, you Illinois, uh, oh, you know, somebody who's lived with somebody uh, for 20 or 30 years, that's not a common law marriage. Maybe that was the question earlier. Uh, however, there have been some states where a judge, I remember in Texas, said even, even one night could be enough to be considered uh, a common law marriage. But Illinois does not recognize that. So just a man and woman who live together in Illinois, no, that's no different than two friends who are living together who are roommates as far as the state of Illinois is concerned. If your client died, do their family, let's see. If my client died, does my family contact you to take care of what's in the trust. So I would not act, I don't act as the trustee or the executor for, you know, an estate plan. Uh, however, whoever the executor or trustee is usually will hire me or hire, you know, an attorney to assist them in, you know, distributing the monies from the trust or executing the trust, however it is drawn up. They don't legally have to, but uh, a lot of people who don't use an attorney later on, they, you know, th they can oftentimes get in trouble or not do the right thing and a lot more expensive uh, to try to get somebody later on as opposed to working with somebody from the beginning. 
how many states do I have my license in to do this? Uh, I am only licensed in the state of Illinois. Uh, most attorneys are only licensed in one state. If you want to do it in multiple states, very difficult because you, you have to practice frequently in those states to keep up with the laws, the continuing education, and also the form. So, um, but however, for people who have property in multiple states, usually I do the state planning. I transfer the real estate in the state of Illinois, and I just tell them all you need is an attorney or a title company in that other state to transfer the real estate. I do it all the time, and a lot of attorneys do it all the time. Most attorneys who have licenses in multiple states are going to be at a very large firm. Not all, but most. Uh, let's see. Where should wills and trusts be stored? Well, it depends. Uh, I, well, I cannot tell you where yours should be stored. I usually tell my clients safe deposit boxes that have your executor and or trustee named on it. Um, I used to say a fireproof safe. I had a few clients who had a 200 pound safe and some people broke into their house and stole the entire safe with their original estate planning documents. Is it easy to practice in other multiple states? Uh, the answer is, I don't believe so. I have a few colleagues who are in larger firms and usually the answer is I've got so much work to do in my own state. I don't have enough time to keep up on it and do it in a, another state. Um, so yeah. Okay, well, as it's about, uh, let's see, eight, eight o'clock. Um, and let's see, do I have anything else in Q&A? No, nothing else in Q&A. So uh, I think I've answered everything I hopefully have in chat. Um, so uh, I hope you've all enjoyed today's program. Uh, thank you for coming to see me. Uh, thank you to the Schaumburg Library. And of course, thank you to Patty for hosting me yet again. And Pleasure. for anyone who wants to see the program, you'll probably see it. Uh, you should probably get a link uh, with the recording if you did sign up for the program. Am I going to do this in person? Um, yes, I, I will be here and probably in person next year around this time at the Schomburg Library. Or if you want to see my upcoming programs, as I pointed out, uh, you can see my list on my website. It has a presentation tab and you can see all of my upcoming programs for the suburbs. Most of them will be in person. The only reason this is not in person is due to the construction at the library at the moment. Jacob, thank you. And yes. I hope everyone has a nice night. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a good evening. Bye. Good night.